Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Eat Right the Easy Way. My name is Sarah Speltz, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered as part of our alumni educational programming. Many of our educational programs are held on campus or in person, but we offer these webinars because we want to connect with our alumni around the globe. And we do have alumni joining us today from, among other places, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Louisiana, Montana, New Jersey and New York, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia and Wisconsin, and of course, throughout New England. We also have an alum listening in from Ireland today. We're really happy to have you all with us. Before I introduce today's speaker, just a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being hosted on our Zoom online platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of this presentation, contact Zoom support at the number on your screen, which is 1-888-799-9666. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available soon in about a week at bu.edu slash alumni. I will also send everyone an email letting you know where to find that video. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you have, and you're welcome to submit your questions anytime through the Q&A box. You just hover either at the top or bottom of your screen and select Q&A. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Joining us from her office here on the BU campus with a special guest you may notice in the background is Joan Salji Blake. Joan is a double terrier with degrees from BU's College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College, and from BU's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. She is clinical professor in the Department of Health Sciences, Programs and Nutrition at Sargent College and the author of Nutrition in You. Joan was an Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics media spokesperson for close to a decade and she has conducted over 1,500 media interviews. She is a nationally sought after nutrition media expert and speaker. Her passion is to help folks fight obesity, heart disease, and diabetes, and other conditions with a knife and fork. And Joan has a new podcast, which Rhett is a fan of. It's called Spot On, and you can find it on iTunes. Joan, thank you so much for being here today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I'm going to click on my PowerPoint. Let's see. Maybe. Yep. Just click the green share button so we can all see it. Okay. I've never been good at sharing, okay? <laughs> this is what the problem is. Okay. So I am I'm going to start it. Here we go. Ah, like magic. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to come on here and talk about uh, you know something that I absolutely love, and that is food nutrition, helping people really take better control of their life. So I hope my goal here is to help you um, eat right the easy way. And this was actually the title of my first uh, trade book, and eat. Easy stands for eat right as sensibly as you can. Because I know you all have crazy, crazy lives and you're hearing so many things in the media, some are good, some not, uh, some are quackery. So I wanna set the record straight about really how to you know, fight so many of your chronic diseases and help you live longer and have more happily in a very delicious way and that's through your diet. So here, let me always start off, I always start off with a positive message and uh, looking at longevity and boy, time is going uh, in our favor here. You know, over the past 15 years, the population age 65 and over has increased about 35 million to over 45 million um, uh, for, I'm sorry, 49 million in 2016. That's a 40% increase. And that is expected to double to 98 million in 2060. So, you know, things are moving in a, in a terrific uh, direction and 
changing in your lifestyle and your diet can help you live longer and live longer in a healthy manner. And you know, you only have to go back to Hollywood to see how it's all working out. This is um, supermodel Mae Musk. She's a supermodel. She is 70 years old. Uh, she actually, believe it or not, is a registered dietitian. She's a great colleague of mine. So obviously her diet has served her well. Uh, the name Musk may ring a bell. Yes, she's the mother of the infamous Elon Musk, as well as her other children. So she has gotten a second career as a supermodel on the runway. But, you know, move over because is 85 the new 65? This is Carmen. And Carmen is the oldest working runway model still doing runway shows at 87. So the, the outlook for us to go on to age beautifully inside and out is there. And here is the good news and not so good news. If you look at the leading causes of death, in the United States, heart disease, cancer, accidents, respiratory disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, flu, kidney disease, and unfortunately self-harm, all of the ones in red, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and type 2 diabetes, so four of the top seven can be reduced with a knife and a fork. So your diet can reduce your risk of these type of chronic conditions that are causing you to um, not live a long and healthy life. So to me, that is so empowering for you to change what you're eating, change some of your lifestyle and help you live a healthier and a longer life. And you know, don't believe me, just go to the Mediterranean diet and we have so much research and data on this where the life expectancy is high and the incidence of disease is low. So they are doing it. People follow the Mediterranean diet, specifically those in that area, Italy, uh, Greek, Greece, we have gotten data on this and they live a long and healthy life. So there is something going on here. So what I wanna cover today is to give you some things to do to help you to live longer and better. So we want to talk about today is decreasing obesity, saturated fat, uh, added sugars and sodium in your diet, and at the same time, increasing some yummy, delicious things in your diet, fruits and vegetables, whole grains and fish, which can add to um, uh, uh, your aging in a healthy manner. <sighs> Unfortunately, Unfortunately, when you look at one chronic condition that feeds into all four of these, the heart disease, the, the stroke or the high blood pressure, certain cancers and type 2 diabetes, the one common condition is obesity. Obesity increases the risk of all of these issues. So right off the bat, getting weight under in a healthy manner in, into a healthy weight is going to help with so many things in your life. And it is not cosmetic. It is healthcare costs. Things are, are you know, you're being way overweight to an unhealthy level will increase these conditions con con and decrease, of course, your, your way of life. So the question is, do we really have an obesity problem here in the United States? And I just have to show you this data, which is from the CDC. And if you're looking at this map of the United States, you know, we started this, that there are a lot of BU Terriers all over the country uh, listening right now. So quickly find your state that you're living in. And if your state is green, that means 20 to 25% of the people that live in that state are considered obese. If you're living in a yellow state like Florida, 25 to 30% of the folks that live in that state are considered obese. And if you're in orange states, which is, um, Texas, then 30 to 35% of the people that live in that state are considered to be obese. This is data that was collected in 2011. And what they do is they collect it every year to get a nice census of what's happening with the weight of Americans. And we are going in the wrong direction. So this is data from 2011. This is data, sorry, we did a, a quick flip of 2000. My, my cursor went 
a little crazy. There we go. Sorry about 2012. 2013, I always say that, you know, whenever it, they add a color, it's never a good news. And that if you're living in a red state, that means over 35% of the folks that live in that state are considered obese. This is 2014. This is 2015. This is 16. And the last data that we have is 2017. And if you're living in Colorado, Hawaii, or Washington, DC, uh, you're doing the best out of all of us. So again, we're moving in the wrong direction and we need to get a handle on this. And there are some tricks of the trade that you can implement in your lifestyle that can help you better manage your weight. We know that food is fuel and you need fuel uh, to run your body, your, especially your brain loves good, good fuel. And we only have to travel back to the Mediterranean and that, that diet that gave longevity and low incidence of, of heart disease and cancer and stroke. And look at what a week's worth of food may look like for people living in the Mediterranean, in this case, in Italy. You're seeing plenty of fruits and vegetables, breads, you have legumes in there. It's just lovely. Now, looking at this picture, let's sail to America. Here we go, a typical American diet, a week's worth of food. I have to chuckle here, so I'm so glad that these brothers have their own snacks so there's no fighting over the pizza. But if you look at this, it's really so different than that Mediterranean diet. I mean, it, it's like it's like a treasure hunting. You gotta try to find out where the fruits and vegetables are. I mean, you have to really, really hone in here and you see the percentage and how small it really is. So it's no wonder when you have diet that looks like this rather than one that is, you know, uh, uh, you, you know increasing more fruits and vegetables, and whole grains, why we have a problem. Off the bat, we're gonna get into, I wanna get into a second exactly what your diet would possibly look like to help you better manage your weight. But I wanna tell you about some fascinating, fascinating research that is coming out. And if we look at the diets of Americans, many people, and maybe this will hit home with some of you, eat, you know, in a triangular fashion, you get up in the morning, you're running around. If you have kids at home, you're trying to get them out the door. You're grabbing coffee. You know, maybe you don't have time to eat breakfast. You're getting coffee on a row. Maybe you get a piece of fruit. You get to work. You're heavy doing work. You're running through deadlines. Maybe you're skipping lunch or skimping on lunch or powering your way through a power bar. And then what happens is you come in the door and you're so hungry that you're eating anything that's not moving. And you're quickly trying to get dinner on the table or you're doing takeout. If you have other people to take care of, there's things that have to get done. Finally, everything settles down and you call your two best friends with our Ben and Jerry or your even better friend, which is a cabinet. So if you look at this and you look at this, this is very, very typical of the eating pattern of Merry Americans. And, you know, I used to have a private practice that specialized in weight management. And I tell you, if I had a dollar for every one of my patients that ate in this format, I'd be a wealthy woman. And this is really, really crazy because this is the time of day when you need all that fuel. You need that food. We had that first slide that said food is fuel. Yet when you look at it, look where the fuel is coming in. This is just, it's just lopsided. And this is crazy. I mean, if you got in your car in the morning to which needs fuel, known as gasoline, and it was on empty, that car wouldn't be able to leave the driveway. But what happens with your body, you will, you know, take break down your, your stores to feed it, but it's not optimal for your brain because your brain loves glucose. It's just not optimal, this type of eating pattern. And I used to say to my uh, clients, if you continue to eat like this triangular pattern, you may be able to get away with it in your 20s and 30s, but in your 40s and 50s, you're going to start looking like a triangle. And it becomes very challenging. And we now have the possible science 
of why this is wrecking havoc with the bathroom scale. So they study came out and more and more study are coming out and that it's all about circadian rhythms. And circadian rhythms are the, the rhythms in your body um, they are 24-hour rhythm, rhythms that are driven by your master clock and your hypothalamus. And it's, it's in lockstep with your everyday light and dark cycle. So what they're finding that having uh, a lot of food later in the day uh, can influence the activity of enzymes and hormones that regulate me metabolism and can make weight management more challenging. So let's look at this study. This study was 50 overweight women. They were randomly assigned to two groups. The first group had a very small breakfast, 500, uh, 200 calories, followed by a you know, mid-sized lunch, 500, and a heavy dinner. Now, keeping in mind, we add this up. This is a 1,400-calorie diet. We're not really, you know, it's pretty low in calories here. Um, the, the, the group two did the opposite, a higher uh, um, uh, breakfast, same lunch and little different. So what we did is we took triangular eaters and we flipped it. Now, because it was a weight reducing diet, even these people lost weight. They lost about eight pounds in the first group. But what's fascinating is what happened to the second group. They lost more. And this is not a new concept, but more and more is being um, done on this. This phenomenon was actually exposed in the 1950s um, uh, by a, a researcher called a Stunkett, Dr. Stunkett. And what he found is that people who eat like this triangular pattern on a regular basis, they eat most of their calories late at night and what they would wake up and have something called morning anorexia. And what that would be is they wouldn't be hungry. So they would skip breakfast, have a modest lunch, and perpetuate this triangular eating. So there is something to this. So this is one of the best things you can start in your diet is to think about banking all my calories. Don't bank it all at night, but spread it out better throughout the day. Okay, so the first thing is the pattern of when you're eating. Now we want to look at what are you eating? And I'm sure that you've all seen this. This is um, my plate. And it, my plate is designed to remind you how to eat more healthfully. And if you look at it, you'll see a variety of the food groups. You'll see a balance of them where one is not um, overly um, uh, crowding out another. Individualities, because you can get on to choose my plate.gov and you can put in your age and gender and activity and it will spit you out your own you know, my plate diet plan i'll tell you that in one second and proportionality so in other words every food group is important but what you want to make sure is that you might want to have more than others and that this is screaming out to you that half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables, grains, some protein, and then some dairy, and that makes up a great meal. So the personalization is, again, if you go on to choosemyplate.gov, you put in your age, your gender, your uh, 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 activity level, and it will calculate for you a plan. And it will calculate you something like this. And what this is, is just say, if you needed a 2,000 calorie diet um, to make uh, maintain your weight, which is uh, you know, uh, a fairly low uh, diet for a lot of active young people, and a fairly, you know, a little bit of a high diet for maybe those that are um, sedentary and much older. But just we, for I'm using the 2,000 calorie pattern as an example, because this is the pattern that's on all the food labels as sort of the uh, um, uh, reference amount. So what you have to look at is this 2,000 calorie diet. They're saying, okay, you should be having two cups of fruit, two, two and a half cups of vegetables, six ounces of grains, about six ounces of eating dairy. But what they have done is done a better job or more of a scientific job of what a portion should be. So according to the USDA and my, uh, my plate, a serving of pasta is considered a half a cup. And that's not much. 
I mean, look at this. This is what a half a cup of pasta is. And to give you a reference, we have like a tennis ball here. Now, I'm Italian, and uh, let me tell you, I know pasta, but I could eat this much pasta standing at the stove trying to find down if it's al dente or not. I mean, this is not a lot of pasta. So if your pasta plate is looking like this, we're talking, you know, five, six, seven, maybe eight portions of pasta. And so we have to be very, very careful about our portions. And a way to do that is to look at your plate size. And this is really phenomenal. The surface area of a typical dinner plate has increased by 23% since the 1960s. I am about to show you a two minute clip and you, I'm gonna ask you to, it, it, we, will get, we have it as loud as we can get it and bear with me. And so I'm gonna ask you to put your computer volume up as high as it can go to hear it. It's very short, but it does have a message. Oh, you know, I apologize, but I'm going to go back. It jumps. I want, what I just want you to get out of this is this plate here is 800 calories. If you go down to a smaller plate, the plate that you should be eating at, which is about uh, eight, uh, eight to nine to 10 inches, this will drop down to 500 calories if you make it half a plate of fruits and vegetables with adequate protein and and grains. So the take home message here is go look at the size of your plate because I'm sure that they are very much have morphed into this higher uh, or, or bigger surface area. And I always use the term to go back to grandma's china, go up in the attic and look at grandma's china because that is the size of a dinner plate. And if you start looking at the dinner plates that you now see in Crate and Battle or whatever, they are, as you just saw, over 12, ounce, uh, 12 inches. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. Now there's a science to this. And this is this famous Del Booth illusion. And if you take a minute, look at this. Which of the black circles are larger? Is it A or is it B? So just look, which one is bigger? The answer is a trick question because they're the same. But when you surround it with a white space and another circle, it, 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 and, or reduce it, look with the size. This is an illusion. So if you put the proper portions of your dinner on a crate and barrel plate, rather than grandma's china, look at the illusion. You know, if I would have given my father, you know, I sat him down at the dining room table and presented him with this plate on the left here, my father, my Italian father would have said to me, what, what are you starving me? What are you starving me for? And yet if I would have given him this plate, he would be satisfied. So there's so much going on in, you know, the size of plates, the timing of the day, 
and more importantly, what we're putting on them. So we really, really need to look at this and think about this when you're eating. Also, restaurants and takeouts are not helping you. This is a turkey sandwich that was 20 years ago and it was 320 calories. Yet this is the type of turkey sandwich that you would get now. And look how it is morphed into bread to these paninis or whatever. So this is 320 calories. The amount of calories in this sandwich is 820. And the interesting thing is, if you would have eaten this sandwich, you would have been satiated. You would have felt full. But you're given this sandwich, so you eat it. And you're still satiated, but you would have been satiated 500 calories ago if you had a smaller uh, sandwich or one that was served to your grandmother. Spaghetti and meatballs. Look at this, smaller plate, 500 calories, a cup of spaghetti with, with uh, sauce, three meatballs. Look at this, bigger plate, you know, over a thousand calories. And again, big plate, big portions, big amount of calories. This is the hamburger that was 20 years ago. This is the hamburger that's in the Happy Meal. This is the new hamburger. And if you're looking at this, this is a difference of almost 300 calories. Coffee, we're having a problem here because we're not just drinking the coffee your grandmother, you know, drank on a cute little saucer with maybe some milk and sugar, and even whole milk and a little sugar. We're now drinking these mocha mocha luca lankas, and these are just crazy. So this is 45 calories. This is 350. To show you, to, re to walk off that extra 305 calories in the mocha mocha laka compared to your grandmother's coffee, you would have to walk an hour and 20 minutes. So again, you're the, we're taking in excess calories, we're chewing them, but also gulping them, which is causing a problem. And that's nothing. I mean, that mocha java was nothing. I mean, you can do something like this, which is absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. And you know, on campus, there are six Starbucks on campus. Six, six, and campus is only one and a half miles long. And so you're seeing where people have access to this no matter where they are. All right, speaking of beverages, let's do a pop quiz. A bottle of wine provides two glasses of wine, three glasses of wine, a glass of wine, if, if, if that's the answer, I'm gonna come to your house. Four glasses of wine or five glasses of wine. So take a guess. Your answer is, is five glasses of wine. And the question is, are you getting five glasses of wine from a bottle of wine? Well, the size of your glass may be a problem. So this is a typical old-fashioned wine glass. And how you, we know to serve wine is that you fill it halfway so it can breathe. And, you know, again, five ounces it is, you know, 100 calories. It's not a big deal, all right? This is another wine glass that you have, and I bought this, so I take total fault with this. So if you poured five ounces into this glass, this is what it would look like. But if you fill this glass halfway, as you've been told to do, look what happens. You are not drinking a, a glass of wine, you are drinking two and a half glasses of wine. So again, our, our china, our glassware have morphed into the point where we're over eating and we're over pouring. So size matters. Let's now look at what's on the plate, what's in the cups. So when we look at my plate, and then when we ask Joe and Josephine on the street, what's on their plate, we see a mix match, okay? So we see not enough fruits and vegetables, it should be half, protein too much, the grains we have some issues with, and less dairy, and we know we need dairy. And we have problems because the grains on that plate 
85% of them are not whole grains. And we come, the research is quite clear that whole grains can help reduce the risk of the heart disease and certain cancers. Remember those, that was the, 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 one of the top two that we saw on the list of uh, uh, causes of death among Americans. But we also have research that's telling us it could be good for type two diabetes, high blood pressure, and weight management because of the fiber standpoint, you know, the fiber that's going on there. So when we look at the whole grain, what is it? Is it the bran? Is it the germ? What is it that's the magic ingredient that may help you reduce your risk of heart disease and certain cancers? And what it is, it's probably the whole package. It's probably the vitamins, the minerals, the essential fatty acids, the fiber, the phytochemicals that are really, you know, working in concert to help you reduce your risk. And I'm gonna come back and say this a gazillion times, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So it's really, really important that we look at the diet together rather than this crazy cockamamie superfoods that drives me crazy. It's not superfoods, it's a super diet. So you wanna get whole grains. So how do you get more whole grains in the morning? Well, you know, cereal is the easiest way. If it's cold out, do oatmeal, you know, use whole grain breads, whole wheat bread for your lunch sandwich. Brown rice is absolutely fabulous. And who knew? Popcorn is a whole grain. So at night or you're snacking even in mid afternoon, if you want a, a, a crunchy snack, choose the popcorn, get the 100 calorie microwave, don't pop off the whole bag because you'll eat it. Uh, rather than the pretzels or the chips. So, you know, it's a way to get some whole grains in. And, you know, we have to have um, the industry help Americans eat better. And this is a great example, and I have no ties to Uncle Ben. They just had the best three examples of this. You know, you have regular whole grains, you have 10 minute instant whole grains, and you have this 90 second in the microwave whole grains, which by the way, it's very good in Trader Joe's has the same thing, a lot of brands, so it's not just Uncle Ben. But this is what has to happen because our lifestyle has changed. We don't work a nine to five. We don't have coming home and have a lot of times, especially you have to commute. So you can't expect people to make this kind of brown rice that takes an hour uh, in the microwave uh, to get brown rice on their dinner table. You gotta have more convenient ways to do this. So we need the industry to help us to eat more healthfully. And these types of products has helped Americans eat more whole grains. And we know that in whole grains is the fiber. And again, the fiber you need, um, it's, it, certain fibers can help you reduce your risk of heart disease. It's excellent for uh, type two diabetes. We should be coming in at about 35 grams and we're not even anywhere near that. And so we need to make swaps, you know, listen, the Special K, look at the fiber from Special K. Look at, you know, again, I'm not Wheaties, it could be, a store-bought raisin bread, I really don't care. But the fiber jumps. Look at this versus whole grain crackers. Look at the difference with fiber in white bread versus like a whole grain bread. And here you go with the popcorn. So making shifts, making swaps in your diet, little things can really help, help you uh, increase the whole grains and fiber in your diet. Why is the plate half fruits and vegetables? Well, because they are unbelievable. They are good for your, for your waist. They're very kind for your waist because they're full of fiber and water, so they'll fill you up. They can help fight certain cancers. They can help fight stroke, reduce your risk of type two diabetes and heart disease. So we need to get more fruits and vegetables in our diet. But here we go again. If we go to what is recommended and what Americans are eating, there's a, there's a mismatch. We should be getting in about two and a half cups a day. We're coming in about one and a half cups, so we're not meeting it. Fruits, we should be coming in about two cups a day, and we're getting in less than a cup. So we need to be, again, shifting this, get the protein down, and get these vegetables and fruit more covering the plate to help you to reduce your risk of all those disease entities, including obesity. Unfortunately, not only are we coming short in fruit, but 33% of our fruit choices are juices. And of course, what's missing in the juice that's in the whole apple, and you know that is the fiber. 
Now, I don't mind any juice in the morning because orange juice is the number one source of fruit in the morning for most Americans, and it's beautiful. It's, it's a fabulous source of nutrients and potassium, which is good for your blood pressure, and vitamin C. Uh, so go ahead, but you might do benefit by not drinking juice all day long, but thinking to have fruit oftentimes throughout the day. And again, this is my mantra, is that if you, it will fill you up before you fill you out. So let me look at this. This is from my textbook. And I wanted to show you uh, what you can do because you want a full stomach. You want to feel satiated. Nobody wants to try to lose weight be try, try, in trying to lose weight to be hungry. That makes a very grouchy person. So let's look at this. This is to show you an example. So look at this. Oh, sorry. I'm getting quick fingers here. Look at this uh, bowl of um, turkey soup, or chicken noodle soup. That's not gonna fill you up. So what you're gonna do is have a second bowl. Well, instead of having a second bowl and you're gonna double the calories there, what you may wanna do is add in more vegetables, take out some noodles, but the volume will double and look what happens to the calories. So you got bit bigger volume for 300 calories rather than even one little bowl or you know if you had double the bowl. Same thing with a sandwich. So instead of having two sli four slices of ham and two slices of cheese, take a slice of ham off, take a slice of cheese back off, but add back the fruits and vegetables and make that sandwich really hearty, really, really meaty, where it's gonna fill you up before it fills you out. We know by research that having salad before a dinner, you know, a, a light tour salad, plenty of vegetables, a light dressing, before a dinner can actually help you reduce the calories at that dinner by 10%. Now that is dramatic. So fill up, have it first before your dinner, <clears throat> excuse me, and it can help you better manage your portions at dinner. And you don't have to do fresh. Frozen vegetables, fruits and vegetables are a bargain. And I know that they um, are, oftentimes looked upon as being inferior to fresh, and they are not. They're fabulous. They are quick frozen so that the nutrients will be locked in until you go to cook them. They're all cleaned and chopped and ready to go. My goodness gracious, it's like having Rachel Ray in your freezer. I mean, it, I mean, this is like no prep and an easy way to get these on your plate midweek when time is really um, at a premium. So, looking at some tips to get more fruits and vegetables in your diet. So start the morning with some. Take a piece of fruit for a mid-morning snack. Back, load up that sandwich with vegetables. Add a salad with lunch, if not before lunch. Pack some fruit in the afternoon and have a pre-vegetable snack, which I'll tell you in one minute, of salsa and pepper wedges before dinner. And then again, make that vegetables twice the size of your meat portion on your plate, and you're going to do yourself well. Dairy intake, we're suggesting about three uh, uh, servings a day. We're not even coming in just about half. And this is a problem because if you have three servings of dairy a day, you're going to come in at about 900 milligrams of of calcium and that really is almost going to hit the recommendation of a, about a thousand milligrams of calcium you need a day for strong bones and good health younger you need a little more older you need a little bit more but boy three servings a day are really going to help you and we know that you know we are doing good on making sure we're having low fat or skim milk and low fat and skim mac cheese uh, uh yogurts or, or milk but we haven't got the message on the cheese. And we're eating cheese and we're eating full fat cheese. And I want to show you something that three ounces of cheese, ounce per ounce compared to the hamburger, the cheese has more calories, more fat, and more heart unhealthy saturated fat. So think when you do cheese, think about making sure it's more a reduced fat and let's not go hog wild. All right, the protein. Again, we need protein, but we're coming in a little too much. Now, here's the trick. 
we're banking the majority of our protein for dinner. And this is the worst thing you can do for multiple reasons. We know through science that protein helps preserve lean muscle mass during aging. And what you need to be eating is about 25 to 30 grams of protein at each meal to encourage the synthesis of muscle protein throughout the day. And the best way to do that is to include uh, dairy, which is a great source of protein, and some protein foods from the protein group, you know, meat, fish, chicken, uh, even beans, at each meal because you want to get that benefit of synthesis throughout the day. You don't want to be banking all your protein later in the day. Also, when it comes to satiety or that feeling of fullness, protein reigns. It will help you meet help you feel full. So you don't want to be banking that all at night when you're going to be sitting on the couch watching, you know, uh, Jimmy Kimmel. You want to be getting that satiety effect throughout the day, outsmart your stomach, outsmart your um, muscles. You want to make sure it's heart healthy. So watch that saturated fat. Beans are phenomenal. The majority of saturated fat in that poultry is on the skin, which you know. Roast beef is the biggest kept secret. It is made from the round of the beef, a round of the cut of the cow. It is unbelievably lean. It is similar almost as turkey breast. So if you're having a yen for uh, beef, a better way to do it, a leaner way to do it is to have a roast beef sandwich. Of course, the uh, fish, having two fish meals a week is now recommended because we know it increases longevity. One of the reasons is these omega-3 fatty acids that is in the fatty fish. So that's why we want about eight ounces of fatty fish, give you this much uh, uh, um, in, in, a, in a, a servings here. And we gotta be careful, we don't wanna do the fish and chips because this type of um, uh, uh, fatty fish is not gonna serve you well. What you want to do is getting more of the salmon, the herring, the, the sardines, even the, the light tuna. It's recommended that we get about, you know, uh, 0.5 grams a day. Americans are not cutting it because we're not getting it in often enough. And I get this question all along and people say to me, it doesn't have to be at dinner. It doesn't have to be at dinner. So if your significant other at home does not like fish, have it for lunch. I mean, you have now have these packets that you can bring with you, have it on a salad at lunch, make it into sandwiches. It's an excellent way to get those two fish meals in a week. Granted, I love it at dinner because if you're eating this, then you're not eating this. So it'll displace it, but you could also do it at lunch. We want to make sure that you have some healthy oils in your diet, but be careful. We have olive oil, margarine, butter. Of course, olive oil we know is, is the staple of oil of choice in the Mediterranean diet. And you look at the saturated fat and you see it's about two grams, okay? But then you look at butter, about seven and a half. Well, this is why we want more heart un unsaturated fatty acids, such olive oil. But look at this column, look at the calories. So olive oil is healthier from a heart's perspective, but it still has calories. So if you are losing the, the, ba uh, the battle with the bathroom scale and are putting olive oil all over everything, that may be something you want to just reduce somewhat in your diet. Don't take out, but reduce somewhat in your diet. Sweet are sweet on sweets. We are getting in about 17 teaspoons of added sugar a day. This is mind boggling. If you look at the sources of this, you'll see that it's the beverages that are causing the problem here. So beverages, not milk, not 100% fruit juice, is the biggest culprit. Yes, sweetened treats are having it, but the biggest culprit is the beverages. Fabulous news. Starting in January 2020, all food labels will have added sugars on the labels. Right now, they just put total carbohydrates and sugars, but you can't specify in the old label right here, is the sugar from natural orange juice or is the sugar from orange drink? And this will be by 2020. Some food companies are already doing this. Watch this. This is going to help you lower your added sugar um, consumption when you go food shopping.
another pop quiz. Of the three sources of sweetened beverage in the diet of Americans, the top three sources are soft drinks, fruit drinks, sports drinks, and energy drinks. True or false? The answer is false. It's the mucka mucka luka lankas, and this has just changed. It used to be soft drinks and, 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 and energy drinks, but now the coffees and teas are taking it over, and people are sipping on this all day long. So the sweetened teas, the sweetened coffee is a big, big place where they are coming in your diet. These kinds of snack bars, they're taking the place of meals and food. And you look at this, this is where all the added sugar is in the diet, in this food. And when you look at that, you may have 30 grams of protein, but you're having 27 grams of sugar. And they cost a lot of money. Just go into a cafeteria and, and, and eat six packages of sugar because that's exactly what you're getting for it. And it's absolutely wild. And people are doing this because they see the protein and not understanding about the sugar. Hypertension, high blood pressure increases the risk of stroke. We know we want to get your blood pressure down to lower than 120 over, over 80, the newest guidelines. Good news, you can do that by losing, lo reducing your weight. You can do that by reducing alcohol. You can increase your exercise or lower that. You can reduce your sodium. And you can also follow the DASH diet. And the problem is you don't need a much sodium daily. All right, so here you go. You take a penny and you cover it. That's the amount of sodium that you need a day, about 180 milligrams. That's the amount down, down here. This is recommended 1,500, upper level 2,300. This is what America is consuming. And when you look at it, it's from processed food. Yes, you're adding some on the table. Don't ever worry about mother nature, but it's in processed foods. The good news, this is on the label, so you can look and compare the, the fresh green beans, the frozen green beans versus the cooked green beans. And every scenario, cucumber versus pickle. And you can look on the labels to see where these food sources are coming in. So again, the recommendation is to, to get it under 2,300. And for many people, over 51 and over, and certain people with chronic diseases, even less. So look at that when you are going food shopping. The DASH diet is a diet very similar to the Mediterranean diet, which has also been known to help lower blood pressure. They just like the Mediterranean diet. They don't exactly know what it is. And what we do know, again, the whole is greater than the sum of its part. It's everything working together. And I just wanna show you how powerful your fork and knife is. If you reduce your sodium intake to less than 2,400 milligrams, this is how much you can reduce your systolic blood pressure. If you lose excess weight, you can lower it this much for every 22 pounds of weight. By staying active, you can lower it, drink it alcohol in moderation if you're drinking it in too much, and follow the DASH diet. That is a dramatic reduction in systolic blood pressure by a fork and a knife. So what I want to do is just show you how to implement some of these. That is, the, the food on the left is not the breakfast of champions. Look what happens when you follow these guidelines. More fruits, more vegetables, more whole grain. Look at your breakfast in the morning, okay? Look to breakfast to have the whole grains, the dairy. Get some protein in there. It could be with eggs. It could be with a cheese melt that you can do at home at work. It could be with a peanut butter sandwich first thing in the morning. It could be if you want to have cheese and crackers at your desk with some fruit and nuts. So a way to better start off your day. And if you don't want to cut the cheese, you want to, you want to save time and get a pre-cut, it's available to you. Snacks. Nuts are the new power bar, okay? They are high in fiber and protein. They help fill you up. I love these little packets. You can get these tins from the almond board so you can control the amount that you're snacking on because what we don't want you to do is over snack. I mean, if you're, I, I, you're sitting watching Netflix and you're munching on all the, the bottle of peanuts, we're going in the wrong direction here. So we gotta control the amount we get that. Lunch, bring your lunch. You can have total control of what you have. You want to get more fuel during the day. If you eat out, lucky you, because 
by law, all restaurants that have 20 or more restaurants in their chains have got to post the calories on their menu board. So this way you can look at and have in advance knowing exactly what you're getting. And there are surprises. People would have thought that this was higher in calories than this. So it's really eye-opening and use it. This coming in, if you're eating a triangular way and you're coming home starving, it's very e easy to overeat this. My go-to is salsa. The USDA has upgraded this to be a vegetable. Quarter a uh, pepper, use it as a scoop and scoop out all of the, have a nice vegetable snack before your dinner. Having soup, a vegetable soup before your dinner can also uh, reduce the calories at the dinner per again because it's full of fiber and water it's going to fill you up. Make homemade soup on the weekend. Don't want to make homemade soup? Do this. This is my homemade soup. I make a big vat of this on the weekend and when I come home microwave a mug of it to get me while I'm opening the uh, mail. There are many many books now to help you. This is a colleague of mine, to Toby Amador, about meal prep you can now have recipes that can free online to help you prepare. Cooking light, these are excellent recipes that are easy to make. I'm very big on cook once, eat twice, so this way you have leftovers for lunch or dinner. If you don't want to shop for food, you can get it delivered. If you don't want to make the cooking light uh, uh, mag magazine recipes, you can buy them now. And these are in most big uh, box stores like Sam's uh, Sam Club. So again, we want to change the size of the plate. We want to change what you put on the plate. Most importantly, we want to change when you're eating. So think about putting more of your calories higher in your day and less to fuel your day and less at night and flip the, triang the triangular eating pattern if you have it. Lastly, I just want to tell you, uh, and I'll be more than happy to take questions, I have started a podcast uh, that is for people who are going to um, be college students, who are college students or know a college student. It's really for everybody. It's a health and wellness podcast. This came out of over 25 years of teaching, and I teach a very large nutrition class here at the campus, and I get questions from students all along. What's this intermittent fasting? What's keto diet? What's paleo? What's the story about alcohol? You know, what is binge watching Netflix do to, to, to your brain? How does social media affect your body image? So we have launched this. We have 13 uh, episodes. We're proud as a peacock. I'm gonna ask you if you could kindly get on and give us a peek and a shout out. We have a Facebook page. You can find it on any place you have a podcast. I'd love for you to subscribe to it and um, uh, tell your friends and your family. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify and all podcast platforms. So please check it out and pass the word. We are coming, we're coming into almost 9,000 downloads in only three months. So the students are loving it, the public is loving it, and I just love for you to spread the word. So with that, um, I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me um, talk you through your lunchtime, uh, or for sometimes, it may be early in the morning for some people, and um, please follow me on Twitter or East Instagram, um, and you can always email me. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over. Joan, thank you so much. That was great. And we have some questions coming in. So Joan, I will read the questions out loud so that everyone can hear them, and then you can answer. Great. Okay, so there was a question mid-presentation. Um, Deb missed the, rec the recommended dinner size or dinner plate size. Can you just repeat that? What yes, size yes. plate? Yeah. So the, the dinner plate has increased by 23%, the size of it. And so you want to keep it to like nine or 10 ounces. And, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, nine or 10 in inches. I apologize. And the whole thing was if you go up and look at your grandmother's china, that's the size of the dinner plate should be. Great. Thank you. Okay. Ellen is asking, is there a risk associated with being underweight? Yes, there is a, a risk if you're, if you're underweight for unhealthy reasons. So if you are um, um, have an, an issue with your eating where you may want to see a registered dietitian nutritionist because you're uh, not eating in a healthy manner, 
uh, that could be a problem. Um, if you are naturally underweight, but at a healthy weight, and you can look at that at a BMI chart, and you can Google BMI, and the CDC has, has a BMI chart, so that's called body mass index, and look at your height and your weight, and you can see where you fall. Um, and, but as long as you're eating a healthy diet and there's nothing medically wrong, and if you're concerned, you should always check with a healthcare provider, um, it, you know, it, it might be genetics, she runs in your family, it should be fine, but you really need to be checking out, you know, to make sure your diet is healthy. Thank you. Okay, Ashley says, you spoke a lot about whole grains, but people are talking a lot about the importance of going gluten-free. What is your stance on this? Yes, yes, yes. Oh boy, okay. So gluten is a protein that is in wheat and barley. And for some people who have celiac disease, they cannot consume it. it, it celiac disease is an autoimmune um, disorder, disease I should say, and having gluten will just make them sick and can make them really, really ill. So they have to take the gluten out of their diet. So for them, this whole explosion of gluten-free products has done them good because now they can eat pasta, they can eat a sandwich at lunch and, and you know, quite easily and quite affordably because the, there's such an um, amount of these products that they're competitive in price. However, what has happened is uh, we have a lot of social media influencers uh, who are saying they took the gluten out of their diet and they have this miraculous, you know, uh, medical you know, revival or they lost weight and as such, and there's no science to back that up. In fact, I did a spot on episode with uh, Tim Corfield, who is the Netflix host of uh, a, a, a diner's guide for, a uh, cheater's guide for, for cheating breakfast. Um, and he is a, a warrior against quackery. And I really need to, to listen in because we talked about um, this whole, you know, keto um, and, 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 I'm sorry, gluten-free diets. And so you have these influencers telling you to do this. And if you do that, you're number one, A, going to be eliminating a lot of foods from your diet that you don't have to. And B, you're going to be uh, drawn to these gluten-free products. And let me tell you, you can take the gluten out of the cookie, but what you're left with is a cookie. Okay, just because a cookie is gluten-free doesn't mean that it is turned, has morphed into an apple or a banana. It's still a cookie. So, and oftentimes when you take the, the gluten out of a bakery product like that, you have to add more fat and sugar to make it palatable. So you may end up with a cookie that actually has more calories. Joan, thank you. Okay, it looks like, unless someone has a last minute question, it looks like we may have gotten to all of them, which is great because we only have a few minutes left. Um, but this has been very, very educational. And to everyone who is listening, um, when I send out the link to the recording so that you can review this, I can also send the link to that news clip that Joan showed, and we can also send the link to the podcast so that you can check that out if you're interested. Um, Joan, before I do my final announcements, is there anything else you'd like to, to say to the group? Uh, no, it was a pleasure talking to you. My, my hope is you got maybe one or two tips from this that could help you make some changes in your diet or your lifestyle that may actually have a dramatic impact. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Wonderful, and thank you for taking the time. Um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. And I have two more webinars coming up very soon. And if you're interested, I hope you'll check them out on the website, which is, again, bu.edu slash alumni. So on Thursday, I'll be talking to Kristen Casey, who is a BU alum. She studied international relations, and now she writes romance novels. And there are a lot of things about romance novels that I did not know, including the huge industry that they are. Um, but I read her book and it was great. So we're gonna just talk about the genre in general. You don't have to have read the book to participate. 
And then on Monday, if you're interested in the, in the health webinars, we are going to talk to Dean Sandro Galea of the School of Public Health, and he has a new book out. I have it right here. It's called Well. Um, so again, you don't have to have read the book to participate in that webinar. He's going to give you sort of an overview of the topic. But please join us again, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Go Terriers. <laughs>